Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, brought to you by the Registered Master Builders, where we are all about helping you build a better business. We explore the ideas and practices that help us get the best from our businesses, teams, and ourselves. I'm your host, Ryan Castle, along with Dr. Mike Ashby. Each week, we talk to experts, advocates, and business owners in the construction industry to share their knowledge, insights, and experiences to help you build a better business and enjoy a better life. In addition to the podcast, the Registered Master Builders Elevate is also an online learning platform hosting courses, programs, and content that help construction business owners and their staff to build a better business. Now let the business building begin. Hi there, welcome along to this episode of Business Leader Breakthroughs. On this episode, we're gonna bring you insight from one of our members, Daryl Trigg, the owner of Trigg Construction. Look, we bring you insights from people that have been at the front line of business ownership uh, so we can share in their uh, knowledge find out what's made them successful and gain insights and that we might be able to transfer into our own businesses. Look, Daryl is, in addition to being the owner of Trig Construction, is also the national president of the Registered Master Builders Association. And in this Q&A interview that I did with him at a recent workshop, he gives us some insights on things like the importance of personal goals, why he feels like lugging 20 kilos of equipment up the world's highest buildings is a really good thing for him to do his view on the tendering model and why he thinks it's flawed, how you should get your fair share of the work even though you might predominantly operate in a tender environment. He's also been involved in acquiring one of the biggest construction projects to hit the Northern region that is gonna have a huge impact on the community and also the tourism in the, in the region. He talks to us about why focus in business is so critical. If you try to do too many things, you can fail. How he chose his focus and the outcome that has been for him. And why being non-negotiable on your values is such a success driver in business. Now let the Breakthrough Insights begin. We've been connected with Daryl via our program for a little over a year. Mm. Yeah. And we found you know, really great alignment with how Daryl runs not only his uh, personal aspects and views on life, but also the uh, business view as well. So I thought maybe in terms of uh, getting uh, the audience to know you a little bit more, Daryl, let's start with the personal. You know, one of our mantras at Breakthrough is the health, family and work. Yep. Give us your insights. How do you think about the, the health piece and what are some of the personal goals you pursue? Yes, so thanks very much. So we've got um, a small construction company up north, but um, my um, I've got uh, one daughter and my wife who's in the business, who's an integral part of the business as well. <coughs> and um, one of the things that, you know, many years ago, we don't do com uh, residential anymore, but many years ago I did a job when I was on the tools, um, it was seven days a week just on a promise that someone was going to get these guys in. I was labour only, and I worked. I worked seven days a week for however long to get it done, and worked out that I was getting three bucks an hour. But I lost. I didn't know what day it was, or never saw the kids, or whatever. So from that day forward, one of the values that we've held true in our business is no Saturday work, no Sunday work. So all of our projects, however long we program them on a five-day week. Um, yeah, and then um, you know, like a bit further on, I suppose with the with the personal stuff and the health and that, probably. Three or four years ago, I was about 10 or 15 kilos heavier, and I've been in the fire service for as a um, volunteer firefighter for about 30 years now, and um, I was quite a bit heavier than I am now. And and um, I uh, firefighter stair climbing. So this Saturday is the Sky Tower, which raises money for leukemia blood cancer. Um, I, my brother had been going for two years to New York to climb Three World Trade Center, and uh, so I sort of said to him, well, how can we get in on this? And um, oh, I said, can I get me in? Because he was good mates with the guy who started up. said, yep. So I just got straight off the phone, bought two tickets to New York for Marlene and myself. And um, that's where it all sort of started in earnest. Um, so we just, you know, and for me, it, it's, it's really important because what it does it, it, is it keeps me going back to the gym because if you want to climb stairs and you don't do any work for it, um, you just get hammered. Um, <laughs> Things so, get ugly very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. much? Um, how much gear? So when you climb, are you, you're in full firefighter. Yeah, kit? it's about they run about 20 kilos worth of right. gear, but it's right. more the heat. Like last year, it was 50 degrees C in the tower. It was the hottest day in New York in six years, so it was pretty tough. But we just come back. Um, 
on the 4th of May we climbed Three World Trade Centre and then we flew up to Calgary and climbed the Bow Tower in Calgary on the 5th of May. So it was, yeah, it was pretty cool. So World Trade Centre, how long are we talking? How long is the... Um, the it's twice there? the height of the Sky Tower. So it's yep. um, 80 odd floors or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how long does that take? Uh, took Ish. 33 minutes or something. Yeah. 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 And so. where's the, where's the, um, where's the dark zone when you're doing that? Is it like, if you're doing 80 floors, are you, you know, you get to 15, 15 floors and everything's burning and you're getting hot and you're like, whoa, how do I, how do I keep going? Where's the, where's the zone where it's a, where it's most challenging? Before you start. Right. No, <laughs> no. It's, look, I, I think it's the, the, what I've adopted with it is they're just stairs and if you keep climbing, so a lot of guys, you know, like we were climbing the bow tower and the, no, the World Trade Centre, um, and there was these two young, probably 23-year-old kids that had an air pack on, but they were paramedics, so they were in, in civvies and that. And I got the flu, I got the flu just before we climbed the first one, and we were sort of hanging out. But they stopped, and every five floors I caught up with them. Right. You know, so all yeah. we do is just... So my strategy is just get to the next landing and mm -hmm. just get to the next landing. Yep. If you look at the that stairs, that beats you. Yeah, right. So yeah, so it's just get to the next landing and get to the next one. If you do that enough, they stop turning up in front of you. Mm -hmm. yeah, and why, so. why, do you, why do you keep going back to it? Because um, I enjoy it, because of the people and because it keeps me fit. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a target that we do probably about, we've just done two, there's another one this Saturday and then probably two more for the year. So right. one in Sydney, one in Melbourne. Okay. But I mean, to put it in context, I'll do the Sky Tower this weekend in probably 17 minutes and the fastest sky is about eight. So in firefighter kit? Yeah, in full yeah. kit, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I'm not so, fast, I don't Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting it done. Yeah, Getting it my done. strategy is survival. Yeah. Nice. And is there any other aspirational towers for you around the world that you'd like to like to climb? Yeah, yeah, that well the thing is there's the the the, the, the stair climbing thing is probably like a lot of things and you know um, around, they're all over the show, so we can go to um, New Orleans, you know, there's all mm -hmm. sorts of places you can go, but mm -hmm. the, the ultimate, I suppose, is the World Trade Center, when the two World Trade Center towers came down, there are 110 floors, so the idea is the firefighters that are climbing up, they're actually just climbing up to go to work, so they're carrying hose packs and all that, plug them into the floor and start work, so ultimately 110 would be the goal, right. you know, that's, that would be the ultimate, because that's what the Twin Towers were. Yeah. So the yeah. one world trades 110 floors, mm -hmm. and the others are about 80, 72, whatever. Mm. Yeah. And tell us about the camaraderie of the firefighters. So you're, uh, I assume these firefighters from all around the world travelling to, these, to yep. these events and connecting. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah. So it's it's you know I don't know whether you could call it one of the world's biggest clubs or whatever, but you can pretty much go anywhere as a firefighter and, and sort of knock into someone and say good day. Um, mm. You know, we sort of called in um, with the with the World Trade Center climb. Yeah, there's 343 firefighters that died when the Twin Towers came down. Um, the first guy that actually died was hit by someone falling from the building. Um, but the, so there's 343 of us that climb and you climb with a right, tag for right, someone. Right, Yeah, wow. so it's pretty cool. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty cool, but right you just meet, there's people from, there's even some Aussies there, there's some... Um, oh, we, um, let, we let Aussies do it? I don't really? know, yeah, apparently. Um, but Sorry, yeah, look, there's people come from all over the world from... Um, Prague from the UK from yeah. all over the show so and you meet someone new every time yep. you know mate, so. mates every time and Canada was the same you know we met a whole bunch of people up there mm -hmm. you've all sort of got that same common fear that you have at the start <laughs> and then um, yeah. you crack it at the top yep. and away you Get go yeah Cool. And how have you found those personal goals or the um, barriers you have to get past in your stair climbs how have they transferred into your work work environment? Oh, I think just that determination to get it done you know, that it's sort of, it's, I'm a bit more of a big picture thinker, but um, the, you know, the discipline of getting stuff done has helped out, yeah. Yep, chunking stuff down, finding yep. the next landing essentially, Pretty finding much, the yeah. next landing in the, in the business yeah. world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Daryl, give us a bit of uh, background. How did you start in construction? Give us a little bit of insight into the journey so far. Yeah, so uh, I basically did my apprenticeship in Whangarei um, with a local company who did commercial and residential and... Um, and yeah, sort of really enjoyed that and, um, and just went out, basically went out and did labour only carpentry for a house building company and then sort of went from there really. We just started doing stuff and I try and do, I've never ever really wanted to do things, you know, like we got out of the, 
we were in the Yellow Pages for a while, but I've always wanted to be different, not be mm -hmm. in a pack. So mm -hmm. we, when we were in the Yellow Pages, I was the first one to put my mugshot on there, which is probably not a good thing for a business, but I did it. But we were always the first first call that people made looking for a house because they could talk to someone. So, you know, like, um, so it was, it was stuff like that. Then mm -hmm. we just got out of the Yellow Pages because I didn't want to be in a list. And, um, and slowly we did things just differently, I suppose. Mm. Um, and th there's lots of, you know, construction's a very broad uh, landscape. You can do lots of different things. Yep. How have you thought about going, do we do residential, do we do commercial, do we do maintenance, do we do renovation, do we, how have you decided what to focus on? Yeah, so we did, for years we've done residential and, and sort of sort of like commercial and all that. Um, probably about five years ago, I think, um, we, I had probably from 2005 a bit of a business plan that we wanted to be out of residential and in the provinces it's tough you've got to take what you know is in front of you and do what you can but we made the decision you know, probably a good five years ago um, to focus only on commercial. Um, commercial I, I quite like because it's not an emotional transaction um, as residential is and I know you know there's plenty of people in there that do residential and we had no problem with it. Um, but commercial is very objective and so we made the decision and um, we basically we had a whole lot of House of the Year awards on the office wall and that and we threw the whole lot out. Um, right. Threw yep. them in a bin and said mm -hmm. right that's our past life let's mm -hmm. get on with a new one. But there was also a target where um, the Hundavasser Art Centre, which is, a, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if you, any of you have driven give, through. Give us, give us the, give us the background on on that project overall and kind of how it came to be in the, in yeah, the, in the so district. Yeah, so that that was part of the re real reason for, or one of the reasons that we wanted to um, focus on commercial was this project was a once in a lifetime opportunity for any company globally um, to build the Hundavasser Art Centre. So. From what I understand, it was he's a Vienna artist, and the Kawakawa toilets. If any of you have gone through up north, um, that's he built that. You know, he was part of that physically himself. Um, so he designed this. It was his last design, only for the city of Whangarei, and um, it, it took 25 years, I think, to bring it to fruition. They raised 27 million in two years um, wow. to get it underway, um, the project proper, and we really wanted to be part of it. So we. We rebranded, we re get our website to be just commercial only. Um, we sought, um, you know, probably one of the great things the, that um, we have in the provinces is the urban drift out of Auckland, people wanting to just move up or sort of semi-retire or whatever. So we, we target, we, you know, we've got a commercial QS and project managers and all mm -hmm. that um, that were moving anyway. And um, yeah, so we really, our whole focus was Commercial, and we would we would we would do residential buildings, but only on a commercial scale. So one client, like right. Housing New Zealand or whoever, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. if it ever came about, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So the Hunavasa Arts Centre was the real target, and we and we geared ourselves up to get it, and and, and we got it at tender. Yeah, mm -hmm. we got it. Yeah. And uh, you know, tender, it's a it's a nature of construction. Yes. Um, but it comes with a lot of lot of challenge. When yes. you think about tender, what are the things that you uh, think about when you think about tender? Yeah. So I still believe that tendering is a flawed process, but it's it's the way you why, know. Like, why do you think it's flawed? Oh, it's a race to the start line. So you know, like if I was I used to say to people in residential, you know, whatever you do, I can guarantee that you're going to be building with an honest builder. Do you want to find out whether you're honest at the beginning or the end? You know, and we're honest at the beginning, which means the price is a bit more because everything's in there. Um, but typically, tendering is about you know procuring by price, so everyone's going to leave whatever they can out to get the job. You mm -hmm. know, so uh, it's a it's it's not the best procurement model, but people think it's the it's the right way to do stuff. If we get three prices, one's high, one's low, we'll take the middle. You know, but it doesn't really reflect exactly what's going to happen on site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is where all the problems come from. So, so when you're, you know, sometimes you just cannot avoid the tender model in construction. It's just it's the yep. way way it is, and you say no to every tender. You probably have uh, not enough business. So, what work do you try and do? Uh, you know, around relationship building and being involved. You know, what do you try to do prior to the actual tender coming out? Yeah, there's two parts to it. So, we'll talk a bit later about what we, you know, what our preferred mode is, but. And tendering now, I think, and the, the government are looking at it more as a weighted attributes. So, that, that you know, like when we, 
Oh, no, sorry. The Dunedin Hospital is getting, um, like, it's a billion-dollar job or whatever. And, and they're, they're basically, I think there's about 5 to 10% of the points are on price and the other 90-odd percent of the points are on, um, you know, the team and the people and mm. who you actually, you know, the experience, who are you going to be dealing with, what's their capability. Um, because the price is a direct reflection of content and capability. So that's sort of the preferred way, but that, that's still a tender, you mm. know, like the Hundavasa, what, why we had a crack at it was that 15% of the points were on um, price, the other 85 were on team, and, and that's where we put our efforts into. Right. But you good had to team, build good all methodology that. and Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, you had to build it, sorry to interrupt, no, no. You, had, you had to build all that capability in advance. So you knew that that was coming up, and you knew that was what it was going to be rated on. You really wanted to win the project, but you had to play a long game about that project, right? Bringing those people in, getting really focused around the commercial. So there's a lot of preparation that you did prior to the uh, yeah, absolutely. Team start line. Yep, yep, damn okay. right. Yep. And give us some insight, the scale of that project, um, what stage is it at at the moment, um, when's completion, uh, how, how big do we think it's going to yeah, be? Yeah, so it's, it's, I suppose by dollar value, it's by far the biggest project we've been involved with. It's, it's about $18 million, but it's spread over 30 months. So we started in June 18 and we'll finish in December 2020. And we've had a few, it's interesting because we've had a few holdups, which creates a delay and there's contractual ways that can be dealt with and so we're sort of three months out, we've had asbestos and all sorts of things, but all that goes out the door because just after we started, the first cruise ship was booked, landed in Whangarei and two weeks after we went to finish. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> so the pressure's on. But no, it's it's good. Like it's a, Hundavasa's theory, the interesting thing about it um, is everything's random. So so his, he, he'd take buildings like this and call them architecturally handicapped and then and his, his theory is all about, he's an artist and it was all about taking it back to nature. So mm -hmm. curves and, mm -hmm. you know, like so, and I suppose the word that resonated me, with me was random. So if you're in the bush, you look at a punga tree there and a punga tree there, they're the same species, brother sure. and sister, but they're mm -hmm. not identical. Mm -hmm. So everything's random. So if you're in a space like this or outside or one space, you can't look around and see the same detail twice. Right. So if you're in a cafe, there's a cafe in there, the chairs can't be the same. You can't see, no two chairs can be the same, the tables can't be the same. If you look around, that door handle can't be the same as that one. Wow. So the whole thing's got to be Must completely Must have been a really easy random. job to price then. Yeah? Yeah, well. <laughs> uh. Nothing's the same. Yeah. 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 So, no, well, any, uh, any curses in the room going sounds like a nightmare? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. What, they, what they actually did in part, of, that was another part of the appeal because right from the start, even with residential people, we'd go along and meet them where, you know, and basically interview them and see whether we want to work with them or not, you know. And, um, but this one, from a pricing point of view, they did the right thing and, and they provided a schedule of quantities. So basically what they do is they tell us how much concrete and steel and whatever is going to be in it. So they, they take the risk on the quantity right, and then we right. put a rate against mm -hmm. it. So mm -hmm. we say it's going to be X amount of dollars to buy a cubic metre of concrete, mm -hmm. pump it into place mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Right. So we take the risk on the rate and they take the risk on the quantity. Mm -hmm. So that's a balanced risk profile which is big at the moment with all these big companies tipping over and, yep. and the risk is disproportionate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, so uh -huh. it, was, it was a good approach by them, otherwise yeah. no one would have priced that. Or you'd bang an ex, you know, extraordinary amount of money on to cover the risk. Yep, put the big fat, fat in. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah, you have to, yeah. And, and why were you so keen for Trig to be involved in this project particularly? Um, it wasn't so much a recognition, no, well it was I suppose, it was, but what a, in the provinces you don't often get the opportunity to demonstrate capability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, there was a $10 million uh, mental health unit at Whangadei Hospital that was built, Mainzio built it, we could have done it, but you don't get the opportunity. So the procurement, the registration of interest said, how many of these have you done in the last five years? Right. So it cuts yep. all the local guys out. Well, this yep. is an ideal opportunity to, um, for us to be able to mm. demonstrate capability. Mm. And that was really, so, you know, there, there's nothing, it's a community project, there's, there's really nothing in it for us bar two years of the spotlight being on mm -hmm. us sort of just about globally. Mm. Um, that we have demonstrated capability and it will lead on to bigger things going forward. I so imagine there'll be immense brand value going forward for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a big yeah. loss leader, like the biggest loss leader you could ever yeah. grab. Is it, is it going to be a loss leader for you? Um, no, no, no. We'll still we'll still make money out of right. it, but not right. a great deal. Good. I was but, about to take your side and slap you for yeah, a minute. Yeah, good. 
<laughs> no, they no, they certainly um, you know they they didn't want to hang anyone out to dry. Got it. You know, but mm-hmm. um, but we went into it um, not not lean. We went into it to make money mm-hmm. out of it, but yep. certainly with more of that thing of demonstrating capability, yep. building brand, and all mm-hmm. that. Yeah, and knowing how much it can bring to the community as well. So I think the we know that the uh, uh, art centre is going to bring. You know, you mentioned cruise ship, so it's going to be one of those things that starts bringing more to the community. Mm. And you know, who knows where that might lead in terms of other people going. Oh well, now that that's there, and now we've got a uh, influx of new people coming. What else might we be able to build? And what other projects might you get get aligned with? And you guys will be there going yeah. front and centre. Hey, we've done that one. We've got the capability. We've got the people. Let's yeah. grab grab the next. The interesting thing about it is is we're not building anything bar an experience and that's hard to get your head around you know like so you, when you walk into this thing or you walk into the i wouldn't say the toilets but you're looking around and it's like a sense of wonder that mm-hmm. everything's different and you're like mm-hmm. you would have thought of that you know and so we're actually building an experience not a building mm-hmm. so it's quite a different approach and is that unique to this because it is such a unique building or do you try to take that philosophy into every project that you do Every project we do, yeah. So, you know, like quite often when we're talking to people, um, it's like a building is an innate object, I suppose, but it's a facilitator of experience. So homes are facilitators of, you know, like family and barbecues and whatever it is. So it's trying to capture that experience that people are going to use the building for to understand what they want out of it. And so we spend quite a bit of time so. Typically, oh, we could talk about that later, but you know our partnership stuff. Mm-hmm. Typically, we try and understand what the experience is going to be that they want out of it, and then work backwards from that to the building because the building's only the facilitator of it. Yeah, it can look cool and it's got to be dry and healthy and warm and whatever, but what do you actually? You know, the last thing you want is um, them to constantly be thinking, "Shit, I wish we didn't do that." You know. Mm. Um, so if you can get to, the, if you can totally understand what they want to use it for, then you can get a heck of a lot closer to getting it right. Yeah. Mm. And what we talked about before of the why versus the what, you know, the what is I need a need a building, the why is the experience piece. So queuing yeah. into that with your customers early about why they why they want this. Yeah, it's huge, huge change. Yeah, yeah. And I mean even, you know, like we've done everything from ambulance stations to retail to schools, whatever. Um, and you know, like a lot of the, some of the industrial stuff we do, I, I'll be talking to them and saying, "Well, yep, we're, you know, we're going to build kayaks or we're going to whatever it is or widgets. Or well, what are you going to do? What's your business going to look like in twenty years' time?" And they're like, "What do you mean?" You know, but if we allow for their business to expand in twenty years' time, then chunk it back to today, build that, then they can grow into it. You know, so it's sort of yeah, looking that far ahead and helping them out. And we've even rejigged businesses, you know, like a manufacturing uh, aluminium boat manufacturer wanted a horseshoe shaped building. And I said, well, if you get a real long one, it's simpler to build, more cost effective, and you can just go in and out of each bay like that. And he said, that'll work perfectly. Right. Yeah, a hell of a lot easier yeah, than what yeah. we got. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. So just understanding what they want without telling them how to suck eggs. Mm-hmm. A building can create all sorts of different ways of doing stuff. Nice. So that's sort of what our focus okay. is, yeah. Okay. So today, theme we've talked about passion and uh, purpose and partnerships. Yep. So what what makes you passionate about what you do? Oh, I just think that the the delivering the results that people are after or exceeding them is is the most important. But it's more the experience. You know, it's more the experience because I know that the way the part the partnership model or whatever that we use, the non tendering. You know, like tendering is you can still do what we do and meet the Public Finances Act test. It all, it all stacks mm-hmm. up, you know. So I think, um, you know, there's plenty of people I know very well. There's plenty of people I know that we've missed out on the work and they said, geez, I wish we had a... I can see what you were talking about now. Right. It's too late. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so we're acting in your yeah. best interest yeah, yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. you know, the industry's been pretty good. Yep. Um, the construction industry's had a few shysters in it which makes people gun shy, mm-hmm. you know, they think they're going to get ripped off and, mm-hmm. and there's quite a, well, a few that have done that yeah. and hasn't helped, yeah. you know, so. Uh, so. So starting off the relationship with how can I screw you down the most, that doesn't build a great relationship to start with? No. Is it, it doesn't? Okay. No, okay. yeah. Is there, is there some industry learnings that we need out there maybe? Um, so Daryl, tell us about your partnership model and how you think about partnering with people. Yeah, so that's that's probably, I think, the key to everything we do, like we still do tender, like you can't absolutely get away from it, you know, because 
government will, you know, like government and lots of people will always go to tender, but it's actually picking the ones where you've probably got the best opportunity of making a difference. So what, what we do is, is sit down with either we can get a designer or their design team, you know, like the three people in simplistic form, the three people are the client understanding what they want out of it or how they want to use it. Um, the consultants and the design team manage compliance as far as I'm concerned and from our point of view we're the ones that do buildability and operability. Mm -hmm. So we're the ones that, you know, like the last, because if a building goes up and it leaks, they don't call the architects, they'll call us. You know, so what we, what we focus on, so if we start from scratch, from, you know, from an empty pad and say what do you want, and it may be that you're the building owner and you're the tenant, mm -hmm. and so we'll be talking to the tenant, but um, understanding what they want out of it, but also if they lasted only five years instead of 12, you still need a building that you can lease out, mm -hmm. right? So our main interest is yours yes. as the landlord, mm -hmm. um, but still trying to make life easy for the tenant. Mm -hmm. So, but but you know, like so the so the partnering thing is partnering up with all these people and um, and starting from scratch and and as we move through the process, it's it's quite deliberate in its steps. So nothing happens and not money doesn't get spent where you know until they sign off all the way through. But you you solve all the problems. So if you're talking with the design and compliance guys, the builders and the you know all that and the client, you're solving all the issues. So by the time you get to actually getting it down on paper ready for consent and all that and building mm -hmm. it, most of the issues are gone. Right. You know, so, so it's really the collaborative approach is what's what's most important in that partnering Absolutely, model. absolutely. And it, and it manages a lot of the risk and all that, mm. so you know. And do you get resistance to that? Do you get, um, you know, designers or architects coming in going, hey buddy, you're just going to build the thing, just like get back in your spot and we'll, we'll handle this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And how, how do you deal with that? Oh, I think it's trying to help them understand what the outcomes are, you know, like the, the benefits of doing it are huge. Um, but it's a hard sell. It's a real hard sell. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got um, a key client that we've got up north that we just keep building buildings for. You know, they've got a, an extraordinary amount of land and um, they need to put buildings on and we're right in there helping them out. And they know the value of it, you know. They truly um, see you as a partner, not as a construction company. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, like um, at the end of the day with, uh, with a lot of the architects and all that, they, they do talk it, but not a lot of them walk it. You know, which is frustrating, but it's a real hard sell, and we'll we'll walk away from it. You know, mm -hmm. rather than take a project on if they don't, you know, yeah, if they don't want to be part of it, mm -hmm. because it's just, there's just going back to how much risk there is involved for us as a company. Yeah, um, you know, all the problems arise once you're on site and you start figuring them out. Mm -hmm. You know, but if yeah. you can do that together, all sitting around a table, mm -hmm. it makes a heck of a difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so what's your genius in the in the business? You personally, what do you bring to the table? Um, I think uh, the the big picture thinking definitely. Um, you know, we've got we've got a small team. We've got there's six of us off the tools, mm -hmm. um, and so the the way it's sort of structured is we've got the site guys and site managers, and we've got project managers that look after the site guys, and I look after the whole mm -hmm. lot. So and it's about troubleshooting. So I sort of troubleshoot the project manager's problems, they troubleshoot the site guys' yep. problems, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, no, definitely the big picture. Th we've got a QS, um, David, I think, in our office, he gets pretty frustrated with me because he's, you know, extremely good at his job. And, um, and but I think QS thinks a bit different to big picture thinker, so I'm all over the show coming up with great <laughs> ideas and all the rest of it and frustrating the heck out of them. But is, any, is anyone uh, feeling in alignment here with maybe some of these relationships that go on in the office? Yeah, Christopher, thank you for being so honest. Kieran, we see the look on your face. Yeah, and yeah, this is in the active management program for the uh, for those of you that have done the module when we're looking at, at your style and we talked about pioneers and guardians and integrators and uh, drivers, you know, classic. You're a classic pioneer, right? You're a big. You're a big thinker. Mm, right. QSs. I'll, I'll be uh, generalist here, so don't shoot me. But generalists, <coughs> they're more likely to be in the um, uh, guardian zone. You know, they're very, very good with detail. Yeah, so absolutely. Guardians and pioneers, by design, they clash because the pioneers are out there going, "What's my big idea? How can we get this? Let's let's do that." And the guardians going, "Well, what are the 487 steps that are going to get us there?" Yeah, yeah. And neither of those approaches are wrong. But as, as organisations, we need to appreciate that we've got those different uh, personalities and different styles in our, in our group. Yeah, well, we moved down from Whangarei to Ruakaka, Marsden Point, where we are now, 
14 years ago and when we moved I said we had that well, I had a 15 year view that nothing would happen for 15 years at least you know and it would just start to get traction and the idea was in that 15 years to just become part of the furniture of the mm -hmm. in the community and yep. all that yeah mm -hmm. and um, and just build relationships and just tick yep. away you know you got to mm -hmm. get work but um, build relationships and then when you know, the, the bubble bursts, you're yeah. away. Yeah. And building relationships is one of those things that we all go, oh, yeah, got to build relationships, got to network, you know, do all, the, do all these things. Mm. What does it actually look like on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis for you to, to build relationships? Um, it's actually um, about, like, holding your hand up and doing, you know, like, doing stuff. So I'm on the local economic development group and all that sort of thing. So it's... It, it's getting into places that give you opportunities that you wouldn't actually normally get access to. Mm -hmm. So the local economic development group is is all about you know opportunities that come into the area and people that are coming into the area helping them out and whatever. So you know we've had meetings with Shane Jones and all sorts of mm -hmm. things. You know, so we haven't got any money yet, but. Um, <laughs> um, no, but it's, he's, he's too busy delivering the hundred thousand Kiwi build houses. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. So um, yeah. So it's definitely about um, going and doing that things, getting into areas that you you know like there's change of commerce and all that sort of stuff. But I think um, local, you know, our focus is pretty um, relatively narrow mm -hmm. um, in that area. We're sort of trying to defend it with all we can. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's um, there's there's all sorts of groups that you can get on, but mm -hmm. it's mainly that and, and and just getting out. So and it kind of looks like hard work, right? Because yeah. You know the uh, offering <coughs> offering your time to those kind of things. They're very really paid uh, positions. Um, takes no, a lot of time. All. Yeah, it takes a lot of a lot of time and effort. So it actually looks like hard work. So building relationships is not just something that happens by accident. It's being prepared to go and put the time and time and yeah, effort. Yeah, and it's it's got to be deliberate. You've got to do it in a reasonably organised way. You know, mm. and mm. and sort of just keep in touch with people without annoying the hell out of them. Mm. You know, keep in touch with them on a regular basis, which yep. um, I sort of do and sort of don't. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it is okay. hard work. How do you think about the partnering with your subcontractors? Obviously, a big part of construction. How do you, how do you think about the partner model with them? Same deal, same deal. So we get them on board right at the start, and um, and just work through stuff. So we've basically got a key set of subcontractors that we work with. And, um, you know, we're fairly disciplined about, you know, stuff like health and safety and all that. Um, mm -hmm. I think we're probably one of the more disciplined ones up north. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some pretty high standards and we stick to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing that we've said to the guys right from the start is if you, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Mm -hmm. don't, don't back out on it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, don't, health, don't have half an integrity circle? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, health and safety is a, a tough gig because it's so subjective. Um, you know, in the construction industry, what what the WorkSafe guys say is something and someone else will say, and there's all these independent consultants and all that that do a great job, but it's so mm. subjective. There's yes. no real hard and fast rules. Mm -hmm. There's a new sort of term they've got on what's reasonable, you know. And yep. What yep. does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that's the, the one that's always been uh, a challenge for me when they talk about uh, law. You know, was it was it reasonable cause or, or whatever, and you're like, oh, it's open to interpretation in a big way. Yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So. What does what does success look like for you, both personally and for the business? How do you how do you think about and measure your success? Well, I, I suppose, um, personally, it's just spending time with the family and, and doing stuff, because um, with Karen, you know, we've, we're on the um, directors of Registered Master Builders as mm -hmm. well, so there's all sorts of other things. For me, that's personal development. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really enjoy that environment. Mm -hmm. I learn lots from some pretty clever people. Mm -hmm. um, so success, personally, I think, is getting the right amount of time off. As I said, we, we only program our yep. um, five days. projects yep. five days, but we don't even go into the office on the weekend, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, and I think business success, we, you know, our... our our exit strategy, I suppose, for the business, it's we're, we're sort of looking at maybe getting someone in eventually, but it's it's our name on the door. And I mean, our goal is really to use it to create a passive income over the next sort of 10 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can step aside whether we can get someone in or not. But, yes. um, but you know, I think the development of the guys, you know, we've just taken on a new project manager. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic, you know, um, individual. And he, he's sort of a month in yes. and you know really stretching us as well mm -hmm. and that was the whole idea yeah 
correct. You know, take us Hired to the next for, level. Uh, capability, not capacity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Damn right. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Um, guys, I'm going to ask uh, any questions from the floor shortly, so get your, uh, get your questions ready. Um, what's been a breakthrough for you personally, you know, if you think about the, the time, you know, I'm uh, open to it being a, a personal insight or a, or a business one. What's, what's been some, a moment that you feel like has been a breakthrough for you? Um, I suppose personally it was when I got stuck into the stair climbing mm-hmm. and you know had to lose quite a substantial amount of weight over a short period of time to get yep. into it and then reasonably reasonably well held that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, no, so how, how close are you to your racing weight at the moment? Uh, about a couple of kilos yeah. off, yeah. Right. So, so the, the walk up the sky tower will <coughs> uh, take care of that, won't it? Drop hope so, yeah, hope yeah. so, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, gear on all that heat. you know, like everyone wants to be a bit lighter, but I mean, I'm quite happy to climb up as I am, but, yeah. you know, um, yeah. if you put a bag on your back with five kilos in it, it'd be great to take it off just yeah. as easy. Yeah. It's like all these cyclists that go out and spend another uh, 20 grand on their carbon fibre bike, so they're like, their bike's 200 grams lighter. Like, yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. just lose a couple of kilos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You'd be able to exactly. ride your LA 20. You won't yeah. <laughs> Okay. And I uh, think... Um, from a business perspective, without it sounding like an advert for you guys. Um, no, go on. Uh, <laughs> um, the uh, Britta, the, yes. our business coach, is fantastic. Mm-hmm. You know, she's helped out immensely. And, you know, even just lately employing this guy, how do we go about, it? you know, what, mm-hmm. all that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. just that third party look in has been fantastic. So that's been really, really helpful. Brilliant. Mm. Good to hear. Yeah. All right, questions from the floor. Come on, people. Here we go. Come in. So you talked about, you know, the motivations that you have for taking on the big arts and projects and yes. things like that. How's that affected you guys and their motivations and their morale? Obviously, construction, you have difficult moments for your projects and things like that. Do they buy into that, um, into that sort of being motivated by that type of project and things like that in the long term? Good question. Yep. Um, yeah, the the project in itself is is one that um, it's something that you'll never ever see again, and it's some it's a real complex thing to construct, and it's something that if you wanted to construct the building in this country cost effectively, you wouldn't do it like that. Like it's all solid poured. But so from initially, everyone's excited about it and all that. Once you start getting into the hard graft, things are a bit different. And um, my, I think my role and what I'm pretty good at is managing relationships in that. And we've had a few tense things between what I call the outside the fence team and us inside the fence, you know, where we want information and we're not getting it. And so my role is to just sit between them and get the relationships back in gear again. And um, we've been doing that. And the guys are starting to understand a little bit how I roll. So the, the motivation is definitely there. I think it's just managing the relationships to keep it. You know, it, it, you you know that. You know, it's all it's a bit. Tough. It, it's real tough. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, especially when you've got people that are a bit undergunned in their experience and they think they've got experience. Um, you know, it makes it tough. But um, yeah, we've got a we've got a fantastic team. We've just got a team of three off the tools in the office. Um, We've got a, a sort of a project manager that looks yes. after the whole thing. We've got a construction guy that's just doing the construction stuff, all the details and um, ordering gear. And then we've also got a commercial manager who looks after the, um, you know, the, the claims and the variations yes. and all that mm-hmm. stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and part of our MO, I suppose, is in the provinces. Work can be up and down like that. So we sort of we've built relationships with a lot of smaller contractors and we can get them in to, to man up a job if we need to rather than having 20 or 30 guys on site because the work can just disappear like that so it's a win-win if they if we haven't got too much work or whatever um you know uh, they can go away and do other stuff i mean we we had a, a set of retail shops that we were on site fences were up Sheds were on site, it was all set out. We're just about to start cutting and digging up the um, asphalt and they pulled the pin on it. Mm. So it happens. Yeah. It happens. It's, it's hard. How, how do you deal with it? 
Um, you know, like you've got resources committed. You think you've got revenue banked that's going to going to yeah. come in. You know, emotionally, stress-wise, how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, situation? it was it was the old stun mullet thing for a while. You're looking around for a candid camera guy and shit. You know, yeah. but um, but we we just had to crack on with it. You know, um, rang around and the guys went and worked, helped out other guys for a while, and then mm -hmm. the next job came along and we cracked on. Yeah, it, it's it's just sort of the nature of the game. It, you know, like um, I think it's the nature of every business. Yeah, you know, I think if there was uh, one trait that every business leader could could have, whether you're an owner or a, a leader or both, um, I think resilience and grit. You know, they're definitely the things that are the trait that's going to win every time. Because has anyone in the room just had a perfectly po smooth sale through uh, through business? <coughs> no, I don't think you get many responses on that one, right? So we always get these these setbacks. And it's how you deal with them which makes the uh, makes the difference. My my role is the people management, basically. That's what I focus on is, is the people management. And if the re relationships are getting strained to somewhere, I've got to get in there and sort some way mm -hmm. to smooth the path yeah. through. It's the same in the fire brigade, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you get some tough stuff and all the rest of it, but it's about fire brigade's not about fire engines and training and all that. It's about people. Yes. If you look yep. after the people right and, and they're happy to be there, they'll do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Mm. And we talked about at the beginning the Google um, Aristotle project and the kind of five things that they found that each of the teams that were high performing had. You know, all of those are soft skills. They're all people management uh, type elements to them. They're not. They're not hard skills. They're not technical skills. Um, so actually just bringing the mindset as a leader to I am a people manager and my role here is to make my, my team mm -hmm. better and help them roll and be uh, improve and grow. Uh, I think it's such a great mindset mm. compared to others that we see that we go, oh, hey, um, people management, that's the HR department, mm -hmm. you know? And they kind of go, it's not my responsibility, it's, it's someone else over there. I think you're in for a, uh, a challenging time in your organization if the uh, uh, entire leadership is thinking that people management something can be outsourced to it or to an external. Yeah, I mean, my, my sort of thing with people management is the same as a footy coach or a mm -hmm. hockey coach or whatever. You know, you set the rules down and then yes. you get the team to buy into the rules and then you coach them through how to play it mm -hmm. and then let them go. Mm. You know, I think yeah. one of the things that I, I... One of the things that has really worked for us is actually trusting people to do a job and then let them do it without micromanaging it. And, you, yep. you know, I've been really surprised at the results. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people have really sort of flown ahead because certainly our key, you know, our key um, site manager, the construction guy on this project, he was one. He just said the one thing that he likes about working here is I will leave him alone. You know, if he's got a problem, he rings me yep. and we sort we'll it out. out. Yep. But he manages the program and mm -hmm. all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. Let him do his job. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. Yep. Very, very Works important. really well. Cool. Any other questions from the from the floor? This is like the once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> the heavy hitter from Fongaray here. And you guys, you know what you're all gonna do, right? You're gonna be driving, driving away. Oh, I know what, I should have asked Daryl, Daryl that thing. Look, go on Shana. One thing that we're looking to do as a company is um, we're looking at our values. Um, so can you hear about what the values are um, for your organisation? And how do you bring them to life? So it's more than just a laminated sheet that sits in front of your computer. How do you bring life? How do you bring it to life so they're living it every day, and it's not just that laminated sheet of we've done our values and we've laminated it now. So how do you bring it to life? Tell you what. Tell you what. Um, the if you make them outcome statements because a value is not a value as a word like integrity or whatever is just a word and it's like. Pfft. But if you make them outcome statements, like doing statements, um, then people can actually buy into them. And a classic, I, um, if, you have a, if, you, if you have a look at St. John's website and look at their values, they're, they're sentences. They're not, um, they're not uh, like we do the right thing and all, all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff like that, but yeah. they're sentences and they really resonate, you know? Um, so the, the things that people can relate to, because a word is so subjective, but if you put it in a sentence and say, you know, we act in whatever. Not we act with integrity, but you, you know what I mean? So if you make them outcome statements, so how, do, how does our business want to be seen or how do we act within it, um, it's a really good way of doing it. And that's what we've done. You know, we've got about six or seven of them. Um, the reason why I'm dancing around them is I can't remember them off the top of my head. So, um, but... Let, um, let me give, a, give an example. We worked with a, another construction company a while ago and uh, very same thing. They kind of 
uh, outcome statements, but also putting in a language that resonated with their, their team. And one of these statements was don't take the piss. And it uh, resonated really well with the team and it was language that the guys could use on, on site. So if someone was going, oh, I might just take those couple of bits of uh, four by two home for the weekend because I've got a bit of a job that I'm doing at home, someone else had language to go, hey mate, it's taking the piss, like that's actually not, not yours. Go down to the go down to the yard and buy your own. So I think getting them into a language that works for your, your team is, is really useful as well. The, the fire service have just gone through a massive review and they're starting to have amalgamated a whole lot of people and they had a set of values which were just words and I put a submission in which was, I said, look at St John's, I used it as an example. I said they're actually sentences that are relatable and mm. you know it, it, anyone at, at any level of the organisation can look at it and go, yep, I get that. And um, they took it on board and they've implemented it. So um, yeah, so I found them really, really good and that's what that's what we've... We've, we've come up with our own, but yeah, making it more of a, a an outcome statement or an activity statement that you can buy into is a heck of a lot easier. Mm. So how, how, do, how do we, you know, and this is a kind of question for everyone, um, probably all of us have either in our own organisations right now or previously we've been through some kind of values uh, situation, how do we keep them alive? How do we stop them going that, oh yeah, they were so good, we got them sorted, we love them, they're brilliant, six, seven statements, job done, awesome. How do we, how do we not we make don't. sure they don't get, get, um, get dust on them? Because what's the importance of values? Why do we want to align? Because we want to live them, right? Mm. So how do we make sure that we live our values day to day? How do we keep them alive? So is this, ah, oh, nice. Well, no, because I was just going to say, I'm I know the person who put those values in place and I think part of it started not just having values but what they did beforehand when they got focus groups and they got key people within St John and not just managers and people mm. that are trying to portray but right across the business involved in terms of um, ideas around what values look like then it went out because they do love to consult and uh, it's a wider organisation and that and so there was a lot of um, before, you know, posters went on the wall, I guess, so to speak. Mm. Um, but, but, it's a long project, it took months. Yeah. Yeah. I think they just make sense. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. really simple and they make sense. Yeah. Mm. But I think, yeah, to, you know, keeping them alive, it's often people will do some sort of recognition or rewards around them. Um, but yeah, it's if you want to get to look at values, then you're asking people to be seen to be doing that. And so if you can call out peers who you see as living those values, then it's much better than the manager going, you've done a great job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, spot on. Um, we use one uh, at the breakthrough, we talk about being on brand. So that's like in everything that we do, our, our check-in is, oh, is that on brand? And what sits behind our brand is our, is our values and what we're trying to achieve. But again, it's kind of language that everyone in our team understands. So we can go, oh, was that on brand? Was that action on brand? Was that event on brand? Was that workbook on brand? You know, we kind of get the, get the sense of um, how that aligns with our values. And it's something that's very easy for us to go, you know what, we just didn't know, we didn't know that that's not aligned with how we want to be operating. Um, so that wasn't on brand for us, so that's one that, one that we use. Nat, did you have a question? Yeah, um, <coughs> within your construction business, as opposed to your family or project, um, what's your passion? And um, can you think about how that passion drives you? How, how often do you think about how that passion drives you? Um, for me, it's the thrill of the chase. It's the thrill of the chase, so um, how, you know, like to, to to convert someone to our way of thinking in respect of this partnership model and all that, it's actually it's actually the, the deliberate steps and everything we, we take to convert them. So it's the, it's you know if someone's adamant that they're going to go to tender, we can't add any value to that process. So we just basically step away from it. You know, like we are going to tender something that's only just around the corner from us coming up soon, but we've got a pretty good chance at it. Um, but yeah, it's the thrill of the chase. That's what I, I really like. Yeah. How often do you actually think about that? You know, to make sure you get out of bed and you go to go work at a big positive screen instead. Yeah, all the time, all the time. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because that that's really my role. I mean, we've got such a, we've got a really good team, and they chew through the work really quick. You know, it'll take me eighteen months to twenty four months to get a four month job on site. 
So I have to constantly be at it, um, but, you know, or a six month job or an eight month job, you know. So w when you go through this whole long process from, hi, how are you, nice to meet you, Mr. and Mrs. whatever, and right through to when we start construction. So that could be two years. Yeah. You know, we've got one that's six years in at the moment. We haven't started building yet, so it's, <laughs> mm, it'll happen, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, if anyone, no final final questions. Look, um, Daryl, thank you uh, so much for for joining us. Thank you for being so open yeah, no about worries. what you do and how you how you operate. Um, I know some really good insights for me, and uh, I just want to thank you as a member of our community. You bring such uh, positivity to to what we do. Mm. Your attitude is amazing, and your willingness to uh, listen to ideas from outside your organisation and then take them on board and implement is just just brilliant. So mm. thanks very much. Cool. Give me no yours. Worries. Yes.